Hey, Robert, how are you? Doing good. Long time um, lurker of your LinkedIn and a uh, <laughs> big fan of the, it seems like you've been doing the conference scene for a while um, over your, your neck of the woods. How are things with you? Awesome. Doing very good. So greetings from Switzerland, uh, cold Switzerland. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, you know, pleasure to be you know, in touch with you. Hopefully, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a great conversation and, you know, uh, just a pleasure to be on this. And thanks very much for organizing. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. You know, it, it's hard to find some other people that are really not only advocates of the technology in the space, but are also coming with a lot of data, graphs, making it super approachable for folks that aren't as well versed in blockchain as we are to appreciate the power there. Did you, from the early on um, genesis of your, I would term you to be an, an inf influencer as well as a practitioner, but did you appreciate the power of the graphs and the visuals and the infographics to communicate broadly what like the power of the space is? Yeah, I mean, look, um, you know, when you talk about the ways how to communicate, you know, uh, a specific message, I always put myself or I try to put myself in the position and the shoes of the audience of the community, because in the end, I do this for them. You know, you know, I'm sure you can kind of relate is, you know, we you and I know what we're talking about. But, you know, all of these unique insights or very important messages, you know, in the crypto space that I would like to, you know, communicate to the community and explain what's happening and many times give kind of like the behind the scene insights, you know, and the macro picture behind what's happening in our industry on a day-to-day -day basis, month to month, year to year. This is actually what's very important to me. And then, you know, uh, what I have kind of also identified is that you and I can speak a very complex language, you know, and very precise one, but this is for the insiders and the experts, you know, the, community that's kind of learning about it, they are not, you know, at that level yet in general. So I really try to make it simple for people. Obviously, I make it very serious, you know, because it's a, co you know, complex message. But I, I if it's co a complex message, I don't want to make it complicated for people. So this is kind of how I imagine it. And uh, I really try to do my best. I, you know, I create a lot of content ab about certain topics in crypto industry that are very, you know, uh, um, interesting to me, like real world assets, DAOs, market making, liquidity, Bitcoin ETF, you know, okay, Bitcoin ETF is like a trending thing. And uh, I really tried to educate uh, because I kind of learned and, and saw in the previous cycle, we had a lot of, a lot of uh, clowns and scammers and whatnot, you know, who had a big audience and they had a big microphone and uh, they were, you know, I think it kind of didn't end well. Uh, I think I'm sure you know what I'm referring to now. And I think there's an opportunity now for people with uh, some really strong experience and integrity to step in and share a bit of knowledge and, you know, for the benefit of everyone. I, I remember I first came across your work because of some of the graphs, but then you also made me think a little bit about, I did a post a while back about all the successes that Alameda had trading mm -hmm. and you red-pilled me into the idea of what if all of those foundational trading profits that are being made with the kimchi premium weren't mm -hmm. actually as they are being articulated by Sam Bankman Freed. So I love your original thought into the space on that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just for the background context, you know, for people who are kind of not aware of it. So Alameda Research was a hedge fund market maker prop shop. I don't know how you want to call them. Founded by, by Sam Bankman Freed. Um, allegedly had a lot of success, you know, this is kind of a big question mark around it. And then at one point, kind of Sam uh, broke on the other side, let's say it like that, and launched FTX, which appeared to be a massive success story, but it was a scam in the back, you know. And it was a scam, and it was able to be a scam for such a long time because of this tight connection between a market maker and a crypto exchange, namely between Alameda and FTX, you know. And look, I mean, you know, I heard about Alameda for the first time in 2018 about these guys or ladies, you know, from Hong Kong. I mean, Americans, but from Hong Kong that are allegedly making a lot of money, you know. And uh, I mean, you have to understand, like, the, the, the kind of the vibe back then. There was a lot of stories circulating about a lot of companies allegedly making a lot of money. So it's like you hear it and you're thinking, OK, whatever, you know. And uh, 
it is what it is. And they allegedly made a lot of money uh, through the so-called, I mean, Kingship Premium, but also it was like uh, happening as well on the Japanese crypto exchanges. So it was uh, basically there was a dislocation in the Bitcoin price uh, between kind of the rest of the world and South Korea or the rest of the world and, and, and uh, Japan. In a sense that the prices in South Korea were a lot higher than in the rest of the world, if you want to say it like that, you know. And obviously, for anybody who comes from trading, you know, if you have a, two different prices of a same asset, you know, then there's an arbitrage there, or in theory, there's an arbitrage, you know. And, you know, allegedly, they made a lot of money on that. I mean, the story was like, uh, you know, 10 million per day or something like that. And I specifically remember when you and I spoke about it, you know, I think it was in the comments on LinkedIn somewhere, if I remember correctly, yep. uh, we talked about it. And, you know, I kind of remember that, uh, you know, I knew people who made money on the on the kimchi premium and uh, it was not as easy as people portrayed. And it's also like to actually materialize the profits. There was a very long timeline how they made it happen in the end, you know. So in a sense, it's not something you could print money every day, make 10 million. But they made some money, but this was stuck on exchanges for a really, really long time, actually. Yeah? And you and I had this conversation, you know, and then I kind of, for me, it was a question mark, you know, okay, what if this was a scam, actually, in a sense that it was a storyline to create an image? And why would then you create an image of being a super smart trader, profiting on, on a particular arbitrage and what that brings to you? And I do remember, actually, that when I heard for the first time about Alameda, you know, uh, and, you know, I saw their deck, you know, when they were pitching unbelievable stuff. I mean, obviously, complete scams, you know, that I kind of thought about actually creating this persona and image of a superstar trader was there to create credibility. Because in 2018, you could show up out of nowhere and claim crazy things. And the industry was so early on that, you know, you could at least attempt to create that credibility, create that track record, you know. And um, I do know actually that Alameda Research, based on that, uh, on that scam image, uh, managed to, uh, they didn't raise a lot of money, but they borrowed a lot of money. So sa- very similar to Three Arrow Capital, yeah? So they borrowed a lot of money and then kind of they, they grew their balance sheet. And um, uh, I mean, I can tell you how I know why they launched FTX is because when you're a market maker, like I was, I ran a market making company, you learn that the best business model is if you have your own exchange. So if you have your own exchange and you're the only market maker and it's a big exchange, I mean you are printing money. Unless you do it uh, 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 like a clown, like like if you if you do it really badly, like Alameda did, you're literally printing money every day. And um, that's what the, that was the reason why FTX was launched uh, because you can you know you can be highly profitable if you are a single market maker on a big exchange. Uh, but obviously you know FTX took it in a completely wrong direction. You know basically they took assets from the clients commingled it and did investments, prop trading, whatnot, and lost it also, which is which is a different story. Were you a trader on FTX for clients or for institutions? We were trading for a couple of clients for a brief time period on FTX. Um, and that was pretty much it. We were not trading there. We were not hedging there. It was really not for, I can't even say what for specific reasons. It was not in our focus. So like the whole FTX saga, we were not impacted at all, you know. Uh, but uh, I do know a lot of people who were actually hedging on FTX. So they're not, they were not like a market maker there uh, because obviously there was a market maker who, you know, uh, got everything what they wanted, you know, there. Um, and obviously because of that tight link between Alameda and FTX, it was not smart to go and market make there because you could just imagine what kind of special privileges Alameda had. And after the bankruptcy and all the documents, we found what kind of privileges they had, which is unbelievable. Yeah. So I know a lot of people who are hedging there, uh, but not trading. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, I was trading there from the jump for some family offices I work with. It was cool how you could own spot and then short the futures, so people mm-hmm. would have strategies around that, or they would do these exotic trades where they would short the perpetual and go long the futures down the road. And if the, mm-hmm. you know, two years down the road futures, if Bitcoin gets hot and the funding rate goes up, you know, that's going to go up. So there's a lot of mm-hmm. interesting trades that I think they colored the experience on. But yes. I remember in the early days of Bitcoin, all exciting things seem to get shipped out of ETH Berlin and Europe has been crushing it. And it seems to get it, which was always a mystery to me. 
because infrastructure of the financial markets I see is very well built out, and yet crypto continues to do well in the crypto valley, in the region that you're in. So why do you think mm -hmm. that crypto takes hold in where there's a lot of financial infrastructure lacking? But why do you think Europe in particular has embraced crypto in the way that North America and, um, let's say, Oceania hasn't quite yet? Yeah. I mean, first, just to say is that U.S. has a very specific problem, let's say, and this is really a regulatory problem. Mm -hmm. No, not even a regular, it's a regulator problem, right? right? In a sense that there's a very hostile environment towards the crypto industry, crypto players, crypto companies, you know, and that means like it, it's a regulator problem, in my view, this is my personal opinion, but it spreads across the whole infrastructure. So meaning, you know, it's difficult to, to work with service providers, uh, difficult to work with banking partners. It's kind of everything becomes very difficult, difficult because of a objectively very hostile position by the regulator, you know. And then, you know, crypto is global. So then you, you know, the way it works is you go to a path of least resistance and you search, uh, you know, for a place in a jurisdiction that accepts you. And I can tell you, like, due to my, you know, fairly intimate knowledge about Switzerland, is that Switzerland was very smart very early on by, you know, uh, adopting a very practical approach of saying, how do we fit in uh, crypto industry within the existing regulation? So uh, Switzerland very rarely went to change laws. It did change law for specific things, but it didn't want to change laws for crypto. I just always ask, how do we interpret it under existing regulation? Because if you do that, then everybody knows what to do with you. You know, like banks, then, if, if, so for instance, to give you an example, very early on in 2014, uh, the FINMA, so our kind regulator in Switzerland, said Bitcoin is a payment instrument. So it's the same as yen, sterling, dollar, or whatnot, you know? Mm -hmm. And then that's great, right? Because then we know what, how we do KYC, we know how we do AML. The banks know how to treat you, right? Because it's a, then a very familiar framework. And that's better than changing laws, because if you change laws, then everybody has to change internally everything, you know? So... Switzerland kind of took a, this very, you know, pragmatic approach, and that kind of sparked uh, a, a movement that a lot of companies kind of flocked to Switzerland in search of, you know, uh, safety and security, you know. And the famous example is Ethereum Foundation. Mm -hmm. So most people don't know that Ethereum, Ethereum was not started in Switzerland, you know. It was actually in Canada. This is where it was set up originally. And because it didn't fly there, it didn't work. And it actually moved to Switzerland. And then, you know, uh, uh, I mean, a local but a famous today a law firm called MME pioneered the so-called foundation model. So you set up a foundation, you know, that does the ICO, raises capital, that issues the token, and they correct that capital, and then they funded the development of the project, you know. So this and this was, you know, and then every ICO was basically after that was done in Switzerland in the same way. And then kind of uh, uh, around that innovation, this so-called foundation model, you had basically, uh, you know, banking partners who participate that, lawyers, custodians, I mean, you name it, you know, like the whole setup was was created. Yeah? And look, I, it was the same across the world, you know, in uh, specific jurisdictions where, you know, crypto was uh, searching for safety and security. You know, I do think that uh, Switzerland was kind of lucky in these early days in uh, setting up a clear... Uh, framework, how, how things are done. We then attracted a lot, a lot of people during the ICO bubble. And, you know, today, to give you an example, in Switzerland, you have 20 crypto friendly, more than 20 crypto friendly banks. So if you show up in Switzerland as a crypto project, you, you ask yourself, with whom do I want to work with? So it's not like who will work with me, please, anyone, you know, it's like, with whom do I want to work with, right? And that's a good setup, but this is mostly on the infrastructure side, you know, and not to over glorify Switzerland, which has its own challenges and its own problems. It's not like a paradise, you know, but it's it's good that you have options. right? And that's kind of what sparked things a little bit. So to give you a little bit of perspective, like from Europe and Switzerland. You know? I love because I think the existing banking world out of New York, which I saw you did a little bit of time in New York uh, in 09 yeah. when I was there, that yeah. they look to what banking is being done in in Switzerland, and that's like a good bellwether. But I love the way that you put up, you know, Wall Street is ready to conquer real world assets and mm -hmm. not only like the FOMO, but you're giving real information about what JP Morgan, Swift, um, you know, Standard Chartered, Alibaba, KKR, like yes. Goldman, 
these are real projects that are going on chain. So I'd love to know what excites you when you talk to people at conferences about real world assets or when you see so much of this, what's happening for fractionalizing U.S. bonds, mm -hmm. real estate, like what do you think is a compelling aspect of real world assets that people are not quite getting? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll try to give like a high level overview because real world assets have a very different perspective, how you look at it, from which angle. And uh, also then say like what's missing, what's exciting now and where hopefully it will converge, you know. So just to say like, you know, tokenizing real world assets, it seems like it's something new, but it's not. Mm. Tokenization in crypto space has been around for 10 years. People have been tokenized a, a, nine, a bunch of stuff and never really thinking who the hell is going to buy these tokens, right? For me, this is mind blowing when people come to me and say, I want to tokenize uranium. I want to tokenize gold. I want to tokenize gold. My first question is, who is going to buy that garbage? <laughs> Tell me, who is going to buy it, you know? Because, you know, you, you come from finance, so you know the distribution is king, right? If you have distribution, then everything works. So now, okay, why is now uh, why is it now the case that real world assets are hot? And it turns out there's two reasons for that. One that's purely crypto driven and that one that is macro driven, completely non-crypto non related. And I'll say the crypto uh, driven. So... A uh, year, two years ago, you had BlockFi, Voyager, Gemini, Celsius, all of these clowns going around and telling you, give me your stable coins, give me your cryptos, I'll give you a yield between 8 to 10%. Unbelievable, right? It sounds like spectacular. Nobody had any clue how that was possible, right? But, you know, all of these guys raised billions and billions from professional and retail investors. And in the back, obviously, landed out to Alameda, Three Arrow Capital, Genesis, you know, these guys who blew up, right? So this was the, this is the so-called crypto shadow banking space, right? It's it's like a basically you have companies who are behaving like banks, but they were not regulated banks. That's why they're called shadow banks. And the crypto are crypto shadow banks because they are operating in crypto. So they all blew up because they were promising unrealistic yield, and that you know basically could never materialize. So this collapsed, and this the crypto yield basically went down to zero. So the really realistic yield. You know, since all of this thing collapsed in the crypto space is pretty much zero at scale. So if you want to do it at scale, it's at zero. So this was actually one thing that happened. Now, the other thing that happened in the macro world, completely unrelated to crypto, is that the uh, um, interest rates went to zero to 6%. Mm -hmm. So the Fed over a couple of months raised interest rate from zero to 5.5%. Now, what that meant is that the stuff in the real world had could give you a big return. But the yield in crypto was actually zero. And then everybody in crypto who was still, still searching for a yield could not find it in you know, all of these yield products. First of all, because they didn't trust them and they were a scam and they were objectively not possible. But then all of a sudden, the people realized, wait, I still have my stable coins, but actually US treasuries are 6% now. Wouldn't it be awesome for me to invest into US treasuries? And this is why real world assets became hot in the last year and a half. And a lot of people don't understand it because they think that all of a sudden real world assets popped out. And I say, no, they were there all the time. They were just not attractive from a yield perspective. And now we have this opportunity, you know, while the yields are hot, you know, uh, real uh, yields in the real world are still high, that you can tokenize a lot of stuff like the government bonds, bring it to the crypto world, and then offer it, you know, to the ecosystem for investment. But I wanna now, you know, then make a turn now, but this is purely for crypto native companies. What I just described is for crypto native companies. No institutional investor would do now what I just described. And there's a reason for that is because how uh, real world assets, tokenized real world assets actually are, 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 are brought on chain. And this is, you know, as a finance expert, you know it, you know, you have to set up an SPV. An SPV actually buys the asset and holds it and manages it. We actually tokenize the SPV. We don't have to tokenize real world assets. And then we bring tokenized, you know, you can kind of think of it as a fund, tokenized, you know, uh, units of the fund. We bring it on chain, then people invest to that. And you have the rails, you know, that take capital from the crypto world and move it to the SPV into the real world assets. And then, you know, you get your yield. And obviously, no institutional investor will do that because SPVs cost money. All of this stuff that I just described costs a lot of money. And if you're a big asset manager, you can open a, a securities account with a prime uh, with a prime broker, let's say with Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs will do all the stuff you just, that I just described to you for a few basis points. You don't have to pay a ton of money. So, you know, what I just described, this tokenization real world assets, is not happening in among the institutional investors. And when I talk to them, there is a reason for that. 
is because, first of all, they want to see assets on chain, like directly issued on chain, because then you don't need the SPV, you don't know all of this stuff, uh, you know, all of these costs. But to issue assets on chain, you need uh, uh, you need actually to change laws in many cases because many jurisdictions don't allow that you natively issue, issue assets on chain. And the second thing, even more important, is that they're afraid of stable coins. So when I talk to institutional investors and I tell them, if we put assets on chain, they're issued and recorded there, and you have access to, you know, to blockchain and everything, would you invest with the infrastructure? They say no, because they're afraid of stable coins. And the missing link there is something that I don't like personally, is CBDCs. Mm -hmm. They see comfort in CBDCs, right? Because this is your equivalent of, you know, being backed by the central bank, supported by the central bank and the government and the regulator. And I was kind of, my feedback that I got was, we need CBDCs there because then they mitigate the risks around stable coins. And there they cannot have risks. You know, you cannot be a professional asset manager. You just move on chain, you put some capital there and then one of these big stable coin issuers blows up and then, you know, you will look very stupid, you know? So... The missing link there is something I don't like personally, and that's CBDCs. And then it could become interesting. And there's been some leaders in the DAO space. Um, MakerDAO has been doing some interesting things. Yes. You did a great chart about not only all the activity that's happening on DAOs, but how much assets that the treasuries themselves have discretion over. Yes. And yes. in particular, for fiat deposits with Circle, for commodities with Paxos, with government bonds with Franklin Templeton. And I love the comparison of the on-chain value versus off-chain and the potential there. So are, are you seeing that once a lot of those concerns get ironed out and they realize that their counterparties are just other Wall Street banks and they're using blockchain as a settlement layer, that things will fall into place? Or what are some roadblocks do you think that need to fall for this to become more mainstream, just to face Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as you said, you know, objectively today, the biggest investor in the world in the real world asset is a DAO, maker DAO. So isn't this ironic, right? And uh, you know, obviously, for all the other people to embrace that, um, you you know, and obviously we're in the early days of real world assets. For the players, Wall Street players, to embrace it, you know, would they need a secure infrastructure across the board? Uh, you know, some see potential in in them being directly on chain, but for many of them, it's not feasible. So a lot of them are playing with uh, private blockchains or DLT solutions. I don't know how you want to call it. So for instance, like Onyx from JP Morgan and things like that, where they, you know, they're experimenting, they're tokenizing things. But again, it's tokenizing on a private blockchain. So this is like a database actually, right? And look, I mean, the... Uh, and always, I always tell people is actually, if you want to bring institutional investors, you cannot offer them products that they can already buy through their securities account with Goldman Sachs. This just doesn't fly, right? Because, you know, that's, that's where, <laughs> you know, they, they, that's not, you're not sure that you're adding a lot of value. So I think anything that's more exotic, you know, that's uh, difficult to access, that has a lot of very complex fee structure and a lot of intermediaries, this is where we can add a lot of value, you know? So this would be maybe your tokenized uh, private equity art, for instance. I think a lot of people are playing with that, you know, some commodities, you know, this is where people are kind of getting excited. I think like a great example is like with uh, uh, funds. So uh, like a perfect example is instead of me subscribing to a fund and you redeeming from a fund, right? You and I can just exchange the fund units directly, right? And you would subscribe, obviously, or you unsubscribe. Well, sorry, you would redeem and I would subscribe but the transaction would just be between the two of us, right? You, you wouldn't have to go to the admin and so on and do this uh, business in broker and you don't have to do anything with them. It's just you and I would exchange fund units and you would redeem and I would subscribe, right? So I think these are very interesting examples, but this is all on the tokenization space. I think like uh, what a lot of people are then looking at, which is then very difficult, is how do you create liquidity for these mm -hmm. assets, right? Because one thing is tokenization, and then we sell it, so this distribution. But how do you then create a secondary market for an asset that's natively illiquid? And I would say the crypto industry has a lot of experience there. I mean, the crypto industry has been churning out utility tokens completely worldless. You know, you can't even price it properly, and churning that out like crazy, and you know, with a lot of volume and liquidity and everything. And I think you know, I'm not saying that you you can learn a lot from these cases because it's a different different asset. You know, a completely different you know point, but 
look, the holy grail is to have liquidity for all these tokens. That's the holy grail, right? And this is what I hear as well from a lot of investors. They say, Anton, in the end, if you we can't have liquidity for all of these tokens, then we didn't create much. Do you think that that liquidity just comes in the form of like a Uniswap 50-50 pool? Or do you think there's some sort of private blockchain, as you're saying, that Securitize or one of the legacy platforms might like to have guardrails around? Or as a decentralization purist, do you think it just defaults to open pools where people can transact private fund uh, credit parts or secondary market positions out in the open? Yeah. So ideally, it would be an open system, right? Because that in in increases your capabilities in the context of distribution. So that's the dream, right? And, you know, gated environment obviously always has its own challenges, you know? I do understand, you know, the banks and uh, asset managers and so on, because they want to keep the client base, right? They, they don't want to open up so easily because then they're at risk of losing the client base. So I kind of understand that for a lot of... Uh, Traditional players, they don't want an open environment. Uh, but, you know, to make an analogy here, I mean, in the 90s and the, two I mean, not in the 2000s, but in the 90s, in the 80s, you know, people had, uh, uh, you know, intranet, you know, or, you know, when you had the, like uh, private networks and then, you know, but all the fun was happening on the internet, right? Open network where you can access everything freely. I'm not saying it's a direct analogy because uh, financial assets are in a regulated category. And obviously, a lot of the stuff on the internet is not right. But in the end, you know, open open environment will win. This is kind of my my uh, thinking. And now, will this be all purely decentralized or not? I think this is a different story. But I think from a risk perspective, a decentralized environment would be the best because you meet then you mitigate risks, right? You mitigate counterparty risk, single point of failure, and a lot of other things that you learned in two thousand and eight. It was brutal for the whole economies and financial system in the world. Do you think that on-chain treasuries continue to drive uh, RWAs or what are some interesting fractionalized assets that you see becoming more in vogue that are still early days? Um, so uh, at the moment, the hottest thing is actually government bonds and particularly US treasuries. And I can give you an example. I mean, I can explain why that is the case is because they're the simplest to understand and uh, they're very attractive. So if you talk to a CFO, you know, who is maybe not, you know, super experienced in financial markets, they understand government bonds. It's a higher yield and also counterintuitively, right? It's a, in the back, it's a liquid asset, right? So U.S. Treasuries are the most liquid uh, asset on the planet, pretty much. And it's easy to get in and out, right? So it's you're, it's not like... a private equity position where you're stuck, you know, for a really long time, right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, that th those are hot, but when I talk to people, everybody's aware that probably this year we will have a couple of rate cuts and most maybe even will go down to zero. You know, interest rate will go down to zero, meaning that the tokenized government bonds will not be interesting anymore. And then you will have to move across that, you know, liquidity and risk spectrum into something more exotic, you know? And this is where a lot of people are experimenting now. So even though I was giving kind of funny examples, you know, tokenizing uranium, <laughs> tokenizing, you know, real estate portfolios, uh, you know, tokenizing a lot of the, you know, there's like really crazy examples of what I have seen. This is where we'll have to natively move, right? Because this is where the high yield will be uh, in, the, in the near uh, future. And for us, the key goal is now education uh, because, Today, people don't get this exotic stuff, but they will have to get it very soon because that's where the action will have been. You know, you know, I operate in the space of trying to make all this approachable because I'm teaching yes. students and I'm consulting with banking executives and people that are trying to figure out the space. Yes. I love how Swiss Asset Dow has been creating really that bridge between TradFi and the crypto industry to deliver that level of understanding, to help them understand like, if they want to invest in real world assets, what are the right opportunities? So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're doing over there and helping people that are understanding a little bit, but want to get um, much more deep and have your perspective. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, with Swiss Asset DAO, so it's an initiative uh, led by very interesting people in Switzerland with a lot of experience in the crypto industry, but also in TradFi and also on the legal side. 
where we had kind of like a, a two motivations, two goals for our vision. Is first is to make DAOs legal because three stuff the DAO is a DAO in the end, and uh, make DAOs legal in a sense that you know people have been creating a lot of DAOs recently. It's one of the biggest and fastest growing parts of the crypto industry, which a lot of people are not aware of. And in a plain language, DAO, decentralized autonomous organization is a way how you can manage, govern, and organize an entity uh, uh, in a decentralized manner you using the tools like smart contracts, you know, voting through tokens and so on. So it's like, how do you run a company in the, in the blockchain world? Uh, that's basically a DAO. Uh, but, you know, what we learned very quickly that running companies on the blockchain, you get faced with uh, realities of the real world, that you're actually creating an entity. You have a group of people you know, um, uh, leading a joint effort, you know, to achieve a goal, it many times even generate a return. And, you know, even though DAOs are very exciting field, the industry rapidly growing. So there's more than 10,000 DAOs as of today in the crypto industry, but a lot of them have disregarded uh, the legal aspect. So the key, one of the, the first key goal of Swiss Asa DAO is how to make DAOs legal. And in a plain language, that means is how do you create a legal wrapper in the real world that well re uh, reflects and represents a decentralized autonomous organization that operates in the in the blockchain world. And for that, we have chosen a, a specific model in Switzerland called the Swiss Association, uh, which is a very well-known way how you can govern an entity through members. So the members govern the entity. Actually, there's no shareholders, but members govern it. And we used that specific framework with a specific statute and articles on association, how to manage our DAO. So this is the first part. And then the second part was also how to enable uh, companies to invest into real world assets. And there we have really done a lot of education, how tokenization of real world assets really works. You know, I talk nonstop about, you know, SPVs, how they function, what does tokenization really mean? How do you actually solve the challenges of distribution? Because in the end, you know, tokenized real world assets, it's a security token. You cannot run away from it. So it's, a, you know, it's financial security it falls under the securities laws. Uh, how to be mindful of distribution, you know, where you can do certain things, where you cannot, how, you know, even tokenization has its own ch challenges uh, in context of specific assets. So like a great example is tokenizing real estate in Switzerland. You know, in real estate, foreigners are not allowed to own <laughs> real estate. So how can you tokenize, you know, a Swiss uh, real estate portfolio and then, you know, distribute it, you know, sell it. Uh, but knowing actually that in Switzerland, there's a specific law who can even, uh, you know, own a real estate. So it was really this. So. To summarize, Swiss as the DAO, it's all about uh, firstly making DAOs legal, a very exciting, innovative way how to govern a company through purely through blockchain in a decentralized manner, but doing it in a legal way that gives you protections and uh, and abilities to govern it in a legal way. And the second is how to how you actually tokenize the real world assets, how do you distribute it, and you know what's the right way to actually do tokenization around the world in different jurisdictions. You posted out a really interesting DAO legal wrapper breakdown from A16Z Crypto, where it went into the different pros and cons of the UNA Foreign Foundation, those DAOs without an entity, LCA and LLC, yes. and how they can have wraps around silos of DAO activity, wraps around the entire DAO. Is is there um when do people default to a particular like i would imagine stateside they're defaulting to an llc mm -hmm. and uh, overseas they're looking to um either the swiss association or if they're in dubai or what have you like a regional partnership like association is there a particular place where people start and then they might go into a different direction based on their needs because it's i'm sure not many of the organizations that you talk to are one size fit all Yes. So, I mean, uh, first, the, the location where you would like to do a legal wrapper many times depends on where you operate, you know, or what's your preferred jurisdiction. And, you know, for in many jurisdictions around the world, there are options. So, for instance, in U.S., in Wyoming, you have a very specific DAO law, right? So, again, you know, they change the laws and try to enable DAOs to set up shop in Wyoming and, you know, do things in a legal manner. That's a great solution, right? The same like you can in Switzerland, you have the association model that we already discussed, but you also have a foundation model that we, uh, you know, that I briefly touched upon, or you have a 
or you have also the so-called cooperative, you know, model, how you can create a legal wrapper. Uh, you, very popular model is uh, uh, actually just a foundation or an LLC in Cayman Islands. So this is also like a very good one. And a very uh, new innovative one that uh, in the Middle East, it's in Abu Dhabi in ABGM. Uh, they have also created a specific uh, uh, DLT foundation law that tries to uh, provide a framework for foundations and DAOs to, you know, come on board in the Middle East and shut up, set up shop there, you know? So one part is this legislation, right? How do we do it? But then I really go back to something we discussed at the beginning, and this is what I always tell to people, is that you can set up your legal wrapper for a DAO anywhere, but the point that it then is to have infrastructure. Because it doesn't make sense to set up a DAO in, in Wyoming, and then you can't, have a banking, can't get a banking partner. Or, you know, you go in, uh, as an example, in the Middle East, in UAE, you, you want to create your DAO in Abu Dhabi, but then you realize there's barely few people who even know how to do it. And that's a really, be, uh, really a trade-off between, you know, these approaches is how do you, you know, it's just not about where do I set up my legal wrapper? What's the best place for my legal wrapper for a DAO? But it's also where do I then have infrastructure to operate my DAO? And many times, you know, I go back to Switzerland and I tell people, look, a good option is actually to uh, consider Switzerland uh, because once you set up your DAO, either it's an association or a foundation or whatnot, you have all of these banks, all of these service providers, they have seen foundation associations so many times, they know how to do things. They have seen so many crypto companies, they know what to do with you. And it's not only about you know your legal wrapper, it's also about the infrastructure that supports you to operate. Do you talk to people that are still in the ideation stage of DAO formation or how far along are typically people that reach out? In in general, people reach out uh, when they're considering to set up a DAO. So mm -hmm. very rarely we get approached uh, by people who are kind of looking <laughs> for their second chance <laughs> to, uh, you know, to do things the right way. And, uh, you know, we don't do work with a lot of uh, people like that. So it's mostly, you know, people who really want to set up shop from scratch uh, are uh, are aware that they you know they have to do it in a proper way and then they're uh, looking for uh, credible and and you know sustainable legal options you know how how to do it you know so uh, it's mostly new companies yeah and then and then finally where will you be in terms of conferences this year a lot of the people that listen travel to singapore travel to europe and would love to meet you in person yeah, so um, uh, just to mention, uh, not by you know, I I avoid I avoid the US <laughs> for business reasons <laughs> because so even though I, I like US, it's great and I have a lot of friends there, but just for business purposes, I haven't been in US since 2017, 18. I go as a tourist, yeah. But if the people want to meet me, definitely I would recommend. Uh, uh, not that I'm affiliated and involved in any way. Uh, there's going to be token 2049, but in Dubai mm. in uh, April. And I think that could be a very good, interesting opportunity to meet myself, but also a lot of other cool people, just because of all of the amazing vibe and, and buzz and hype that's happening now in the Middle East. Uh, and what I'm hearing from people like an unbelievable lineup and a group of individuals is going to come. So definitely, you know, if you are uh, in the Middle East or in Dubai for Token 2049, please ping me. I would love to connect and love to talk and share experiences. I would encourage everyone to immediately follow Anton on LinkedIn. He absolutely crushes it. And there is really, from my perspective, not many people that are trying to get the dot the DAO structure right. There's a lot of players that are trying to do governance tools or different ways to allow people to vote uh, in a way that is like, truly decentralized or trying to figure out that. But to get the legal wrapper right, I haven't seen really anyone that's put in as much time and has communicated as broadly the topics involved of how to get real world asset investing done and how you can properly and legally get a DAO to broadly cover the members of people that want to come together on chain. So I appreciate your contribution to the community and lending all of your experience and your CS knowledge and, and uh, broadcasting it out so everyone can understand it, man. Thanks a lot very much for the kind words and really appreciate it. And the only thing I can say is more to come. So uh, more to come soon. Yeah.